We're all set to start. Oral questions. Question oral, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. After the summer, when the Liberals after the summer the Liberals had, even the Prime Minister must admit that he's not worth the cost, Mr. Speaker. After eight years of promising to reduce the, the cost of housing, it has doubled. And he said it's not his job. And finally, he panicked because of lower support in polls. He's recycled the same promises he broke over six years ago. It took eight years to cause housing hell by the Prime Minister. How long will it take to resolve this? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we know that Canadians are feeling the rise in prices throughout the country, especially at the grocery store and for housing. That's why we are taking immediate action to build more housing by eliminating GST, by supporting small businesses and extending repayment, and by calling in food CEOs for a meeting today to ensure we reduce the cost of food. Our priority is to build an economy focused on the well-being of all Canadians, and that is what we will do every day in this House. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. People can't have well-being when they're living in tents. After eight years, the cost of housing has doubled, and now interest rates are going up faster than in our country's monetary history. Even the former finance minister, Liberal, John Manley, said that interest rates are going up because of the deficits. This prevents people from building houses and buying them. Will he finally eliminate inflationary deficits that make interest rates go up and keep his promise to balance the budget? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, Actions count more than words, and we've taken action. We are building thousands of housing units in London, and we are reducing red, ta red tape. We are encouraging cities like Calgary to put forward more ambitious proposals, and we are ensuring that affordable apartments are built throughout the country by eliminating GST on their construction. And if food CEOs don't make your groceries more affordable, we will do so. This is what Canadians are calling for today, and that is what we are doing to build an economy that works for everybody. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, after the summer that these Liberals have had, even the Prime Minister must admit that he's not worth the cost. Yeah. Eight years after he promised to make housing more affordable, he doubled the cost, doubled the rent, doubled mortgage payments, doubled the needed down payment. Then he said housing is not his job. And then he panicked when he plummeted in the polls and re recycled promises that he'd broken six years earlier. Mr. Speaker, it took him eight years to cause this housing hell. How long will it take to fix it? The right honorable prime minister. We said we'd work with municipalities to get housing built faster, and that's exactly what we're doing right across the country, including, for example, with the City of London, where we've got a deal done that fast-tracks the creation of over 2,000 additional housing units over the next three years, builds thousands more in the years to come. We're doing this by cutting red tape, fixing outdated zoning policies, and building more homes faster. This is our first deal, but I promise, not the last. Right here. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, he's building bureaucracy, not building right. homes. Yeah. In fact, his inflationary deficits drive up interest rates, according to former Liberal Finance Minister John Manley. And that ensures that it's harder not only to buy homes, but to build them. Today, we got the devastating news that not only are we not increasing home building, Home building was down in August, 18 months after his so-called accelerator was brought into place. So when will the Prime Minister realize that he's not worth the cost, get out of the way, and build homes, not bureaucracy? Yeah. 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 You write, Honourable Prime Minister. 
Speaker, the opposition leader's bickering won't help get houses built. Our plan does. The Minister of Housing wrote the Mayor of Calgary offering to partner with the city if they made necessary changes for more affordable housing. And just this Saturday, the City of Calgary approved a plan for reducing zoning red tape and building housing by public transit. This is a step in the right direction, and we know together we can build more apartments for students to rent and more, ham more f homes for families to grow in. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, all he has delivered is an economy that built fewer homes last year than were built in 1972. Wow. And this year, housing construction is expected to drop further by 32 percent. Data from August showed that home building was down again. His inflationary deficits drive up interest rates, which make it harder for builders to finance their construction and harder for Canadians to afford a mortgage. So what will he finally do what he promised to do eight years ago, and that is balance the budget to bring down interest rates and inflation? Yeah. Be right, Honourable Prime Minister. Focus on delivering real results while the leader opposite is focused on empty slogans and picking fights. In fact, when he was in charge of housing, he bungled projects like the Toronto Line 1 extension, which to this day has no housing near a number of its stations. In contrast, we are actually linking public transit dollars to apartments and housing density, and we're doing so without the Conservative plan to restrict access to abortion, to deny the impact of climate change, and put more assault weapons in our streets. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. I just want to remind the honourable members, the ones who used to sit way down there and now are over here, I can see you now as well as hear you. The honourable member, l'honorable The honourable member for La Prairie. Mr. Speaker, in the midst of the housing crisis, Quebecers want politicians to find solutions. But to date, politicians in Ottawa aren't finding solution. They're finding scapegoats. They blame our cities in Quebec for their failures in Ottawa. But municipalities have pointed out that the federal government is withholding $900 million earmarked for housing during a housing crisis. Ottawa is depriving Quebec of $900 million and has been doing so for six months. Mr. Speaker, it's not a time for squabbling. It's a time for building. It's time to be responsible. Will the government immediately release our $900 million? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, we are there to build in partnership with the provinces and municipalities. We're there to build more housing. That's why we created a $4 billion plan to accelerate densification, improve zoning, and help municipalities deliver more housing more quickly. We've also eliminated the GST on building new apartments because we know that we need to increase supply. We will continue to be there to work hand in hand with the provinces, with municipalities, because it's by all working together that we will address this housing crisis. The Honourable Member for La Prairie, Mr. Speaker, if housing is their priority, then they should free up the $900 million we're entitled to for housing construction. It doesn't get much more obvious than that. And yet the Liberals are doing the opposite. They're withholding the $900 million for housing. The message this sends to Quebecers who are having a hard time affording decent housing is that they're not the priority. They take second place to jurisdictional squabbles. Mr. Speaker, that's not responsible. That's not what Quebecers expect from the federal government. So when are the $900 million for housing going to be paid? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. On the contrary, Mr. Speaker, we know full well that the bloc is here for squabbling. We are here to work hand in hand with the provinces, with municipalities. That's why we've set up a $4 billion plan to work directly with municipalities, to increase supply in housing, to build more densification, to improve zoning, to accelerate construction of new housing. 
We've also removed the GST from construction costs for new apartments because we know how much we need to increase supply. That's part of the actions we've taken for a long time that we will continue to take to help people throughout the country. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. For 20 months, Canadians have been dealing with high grocery bills, and neither the leader of the opposition nor the Prime Minister have the courage to mention the true culprit, the corporate greed, which is driving up prices. In fact, when they have the chance to publicly show up and hold these CEOs to account, neither of them even bothered to show up. The leader of the opposition even gave tax breaks to the wealthy CEOs. When will the Prime Minister stop the delay and the disappointment? When will this government step up and force these CEOs to finally lower their prices? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, our focus is on making life more affordable and ensuring corporations pay their fair share. The Minister of Innovation met today with the CEOs of the large grocery chains to reinforce the immediate need to stabilize food prices and improve competition. Indeed, we're introducing changes to competition here in Canada to address the rise in food prices, amongst others. We will, every day, Mr. Speaker, continue to build an economy that works for all Canadians. Well, member for Burnaby South. Under the Liberals and the Conservatives, Canada has lost 1 million housing, affordable housing units. And it's been five months that construction has been going down. Eliminating GST on the construction of affordable housing is important, but it's eight years too late. It will take a lot more. When will the Prime Minister stop delaying and announce that the federal government is starting once again to build affordable housing? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, our goal is to make people's lives more affordable and to ensure that corporations pay their fair share. The Minister of Innovation met with food CEOs this morning to insist on the need to stabilize the price of food and increase competition. We are making changes to the rules on competition in Canada to fight the rise in food prices, among other. We will continue to build an economy that works for all Canadians every day. Le chef de the NDP has now been in government for almost two years, during which time, by their own admission, both grocery prices and grocery profits have gone up. That's the result they get. And now they're supporting the Prime Minister's plan for a carbon tax that will rise to 61 cents a litre on the farmers who make the food and the truckers who ship the food. Their response to all this is to hold a big photo op today. The Prime Minister claims food will be affordable by Thanksgiving. <laughs> so, will, by Thanksgiving, lettuce be back down from its 94 per cent increase because of today's meeting? Yeah. The, the Honourable uh, Minister for Innovation. I'd like to thank the Leader of the Opposition for his question. But coming from someone who advocated for crypto as an advice to Canadians, I think Canadians watching at home understand not to follow his advice when it comes to grocery, Mr. Speaker. The answer of Canadians is thanks, but no thanks, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue to do the tough work on this side and fight for Canadians at every step of the way. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. It's not just one carbon tax, there's a second carbon tax that the Prime Minister wants to impose on the backs of Quebecers. Yes, it applies to Quebecers, to farmers, to truckers in Quebec who deliver our food. And the Bloc supports it and wants to increase it radically, as they've said. This will inflate the price of food. Will the Prime Minister heed the call of the Bloc to radically increase the carbon tax on the backs of Quebecers? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. As it's my first opportunity to speak during the session, I'd like to offer my sincerest condolences to all Canadians and people who were affected by forest fires, the tens of thousands of people who were evacuated due to forest fires, to flooding, and thankfully, Tropical Storm Lee didn't hit as hard as it could have. At, the, at a time of climate change, a responsible government has to invest in climate change. 
and it also needs to support Canadians during these difficult times. That's exactly what we're doing on this side of the House, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Megantic L'Érable. The Liberal bloc carbon tax has radically increased the price of food. Carrots alone have gone up 74 percent. My mother always told me to eat carrots. They're good for your eyes. I invite the bloc leader to eat more of them because he doesn't see the costs of his support for the Liberal bloc carbon tax. The Prime Minister and his coalition with the bloc are not worth the cost, Mr. Speaker. Will the Prime Minister's big meeting with the food CEOs at least cancel the 74 percent increase for carrots by Thanksgiving? Yes or no? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, with the forest fire season we've had, the heat waves that have been throughout Canada and around the country and around the world, some people might say that there are bigger challenges than carrots. We need to fight climate change. We need to help people during these difficult times. That's exactly what we're doing here on this side of the House. What is the Conservative Party proposing? Nothing to fight climate change. They want pollution to be free. Mr. Speaker, that's not a responsible position for a party that wants to form government. The Honourable Member for Megan Ciclerable. We want groceries to cost less for everyone, Mr. Speaker. The carbon tax 2.0 that the Liberals are imposing on Canadians, contrary to what the Bloc Québécois claims, also applies to Quebec. On June 5th, a motion was presented in this House that the House recognizes that the first carbon tax is a failure and calls on the government to immediately cancel the second tax, the clean fuel regulations. And what do you know? The Bloc voted against it. Even worse, a Bloc MP called for a radical increase. Will the Prime Minister reject the Bloc's call to radically increase the carbon tax at the expense of Quebecers? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to remind my Honourable Colleague that in his party's election platform at the last election, he proposed putting in place a clean fuel program. That's exactly what we've done. This program leads to thousands of jobs, billions of dollars in investment throughout the country, and the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers supported this. It would lead to jobs, especially in agriculture. What do the Conservatives have to fight climate change? Absolutely nothing. Member for Foothills. The thing is, Mr. Speaker, the Liberals can reduce the price of food right now if they abandon their failed carbon tax. But instead of taking any meaningful action, they are having more meaningless meetings. The price of diesel is already up 70 cents a litre, increasing the cost on farmers to produce the food, manufacturers to process it, truckers to haul it, and certainly for Canadians to buy it. When the price of lettuce is up 94 per cent, clearly, the Prime Minister's NDP government isn't worth the cost. Will the Prime Minister's big meetings reduce the cost of lettuce by Thanksgiving? Here, yes here. or no? The Honourable Minister of Innovation. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank the member for the question. Instead of talking and talking, Mr. Speaker, they should look at what we've done today. Mr. Speaker, this is the first time in Canadian history that the grocer have come to Ottawa. Mr. Speaker, we had difficult discussions, but at the end of the day, those are discussions that needed to have in order to stabilize the price of food in Canada, Mr. Speaker. We have been very clear with the Prime Minister and the Minister of Finance. We are going to work with them to stabilize prices in Canada. That's what Canadians expect at home. That's what we're going to deliver. Absolutely. The Honourable Member for Foothills. After eight years of the Prime Minister's NDP government, Canadians can't afford to put food on the table. And it's getting worse. The Parliamentary Budget Officer report on Friday stated by 2030, Canadian farmers will pay close to a billion dollars in carbon taxes alone. Lettuce is up 94 percent because of these increases in carbon taxes. And the costs they're putting on farmers, processors, certainly truckers. And you know what? It's Canadians who are paying the price at the grocery store shelf. Now they want to quadruple that tax. How much will Canadians pay for a head of lettuce? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Speaker, I would like to, uh, to read for, for you an extract from a press release from the Canola Growing Association, and which says, We're pleased to see the clean fuel regulations provide options that will minimize regulatory burden and allow canola to be used to reduce greenhouse gas emissions through biofuel connect produ production. Recognition of sustainable practice of Canadian growers to help sequester and store carbon. Agricultures are in favour of what we're doing, Mr. Speaker, to fight climate change and create a strong and vibrant Canadian economy. 
Honorable député. The Honorable Member for Avignon Lamétis Matan Matapedia. Mr. Speaker, climate collapse has begun. That is the devastating assessment of the Secretary General of the United Nations, the hottest July on record. Marine heat waves with global averages of 21 degrees, forest fires so numerous that it's as, as if everything between Ottawa and Quebec City had burned down. It's staggering. The situation affects everyone, everyone, and it's not getting any better because we're not acting responsibly. What is the government waiting for to take global warming seriously? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank my honourable colleague for her question, and I share her concern on the matter of climate change, contrary to the Conservative Party of Canada, and I'd like to remind her that between 2019 and 2021, Canada is the G7 country that's had the best performance on reducing greenhouse gases. 55 million tons less. That's 25% of our goal for 2030 that we've accomplished, but I agree with her. We need to do more. We need to do it faster, and that's why the Prime Minister and myself and colleagues will be going to New York this week to work with all countries around the world to accelerate the fight against climate change. The Honourable Member for Avignon, Lamitis Matan Matapedia. Mr. Speaker, the government tells us that fighting climate change is a priority, but it's not. While the UN is talking about climate ambition, three ministers from this government are heading to Alberta for the World Petroleum Congress. They'll be talking about green oil, I imagine, to show how much respect they have for our intelligence. But the sad truth is that Canada is an oil country, and heating up the planet pays in this country. When will this government start acting responsibly and taking real action to combat global warming? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, we take climate change very seriously, doing the work we need to do. For the Congress, it's true that the Minister of Natural Resources is there. He's there to tell everyone that it's very important for us to do everything we need to do to decarbonize our energy systems. We need clean energy, we know that, and we are doing the work to get it. The Honourable Member for Avignon Lamitis Matan Matapedia. Mr. Speaker, the unprecedented forest fires we've seen in Quebec, and that also happened in British Columbia, the Northwest Territories, and the Atlantic, are disastrous for the planet, for the people affected, for biodiversity, even for the economy. A disaster that is bound to happen again and again. But there's no Congress on fighting forest fires or on the energy transition, no. Here, we welcome oil magnets with open arms. It's irresponsible, Mr. Speaker, totally irresponsible. How many more thousands of hectares will have to burn before the government wakes up? The Honourable Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank my colleague for her question. And that is why, faced with climate change and the increase in natural disasters, we've put forward the first national climate change adaptation plan in partnership with the provinces and territories, municipalities and Indigenous people. A plan to adapt to climate change that was recognized by, institu by institutions like Impact Assurance that has said it's one of the best in the world. The Insurance Bureau of Canada has said the same thing. We need to be better prepared to face the impact of climate change. And contrary to the Conservative Party that still thinks it doesn't exist, we have a plan to fight climate change and to adapt to them. For Mayor Rishi, Grand Lake. Mr. Speaker, gas, diesel and home heating costs are spiking because Liberal MPs voted to implement and increase the carbon tax. The Prime Minister and his NDP coalition are not worth the cost to Canadians. After eight years raising carbon taxes on the farmers and truckers that bring us our food, lettuce is up 94 percent. Now he wants to quadruple that tax to 61 cents a litre. How much more will that add to the price of lettuce. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, what Canadians across the country need, what Canadians in Atlantic Canada need right now is more homes to be built faster. And that's why last week the Prime Minister announced we are removing the GST on purpose-built rental. But do you know what the Conservative leader said about our housing plan? He said, we don't need more spending. I guess he thinks homes are going to get built by magic. We know we need home builders to invest more, to build more faster. That's
That's what our government is going to do in Atlantic Canada and across the country. The Honourable Member for South Shore St. Margaret. After eight years, Nova Scotians are hurting because of the NDP Liberal carbon tax. It increases the cost to produce food, to process the food, to transport the food. Yep. One example is that the price of cabbage has gone up 70 percent because of the actions of these Liberals. The Prime Minister and his Liberal NDP government are not worth the cost. Will the Prime Minister's big meeting with grocery CEOs reverse this 70 percent price hike by Thanksgiving? Yes or no? The Honourable Minister for Housing. Speaker, my honourable colleague will know well that Nova Scotians are hurting for a number of reasons, including we are on the front lines of the fight against climate change. Over the course of the past year, we have seen Hurricane Fiona devastate our communities. We have seen floods, floods sweep our neighbours away. We have seen wildfires like we have never seen before, and these things come at a cost. One of the interesting things about this argument, Mr. Speaker, is my colleague ignores the fact that one of the driving costs behind the increase in uh, produce is climate change itself. Jurisdictions of Produce food cannot do it at the same place. We will put measures in place to help Nova Scotians struggling with affordability, and we will fight climate change at the same time. The Honourable Member for New Brunswick Southwest. Mr. Speaker, 60 cents. This is the price differential today for gasoline between the state of Maine and my province, New Brunswick. 60 cents a litre. For eight years, Liberal MPs have voted to bring in and raise taxes on energy, and they voted to triple the carbon tax between now and 2030. This Prime Minister just is not worth the cost. His carbon tax on farmers has raised the price of carrots by 74 per cent. Will the Prime Minister's big meeting with grocery CEOs bring down this 74 per cent increase before Thanksgiving? Yes or no? Honourable Minister for Innovation. Mr. Speaker, I'm sure Canadians watching at home are feeling insulted by what they hear from this side, Mr. Speaker. At a time where Canadians are hurting, at a time when this nation needs to come together to fight food price inflation, at a time we call the CEOs to come to Ottawa to come with concrete solutions to stabilize prices, the Conservatives are choosing to be on the sidelines where we're acting on behalf of Canadians, Mr. Yes, Speaker. I invite every member of this House to work with us, stabilize prices, and help Canadians at a time of need. The Honourable Member for Rosemont La Petite Patrie. Mr. Speaker, we heard it throughout the summer. People are having a hard time paying for groceries. Prices are exploding. The big chains are making record profits and CEOs are lining their pockets. And what are the Liberals doing? Well, they're holding meetings. Like today, they said to the, the CEOs, look, if you're not nice, we will maybe one day give you a tap on the wrist. It's really not serious. The NDP leaser is going to table a bill to give the Competition Bureau some teeth. It's a concrete, practical solution. When will the Liberals act to help people put food on the table? The, the Honourable Minister of Innovation. I have a lot of respect for my colleague, but I think uh, he missed part of the message, Mr. Speaker, because that is exactly what we are doing. When we announced uh, last week, Mr. Speaker, that we were going to make uh, a huge uh, reform of competition in this country, Mr. Speaker, we are going to give power to the director of the Competition Bureau uh, to uh, uh, require documents to hold legal investigations. We're going to uh, take away the uh, merger defense, which are not in the interest of Canadians, and we want to uh, fight collaboration, which is hurting competition. What we are putting before Canadians is a plan for more competition, less consolidation, and lower prices. For Too many northern communities saw little to no housing projects or repairs this summer. Too many Nunavut are being denied their right to a home. Mm -hmm. When I visited Baker Lake this summer, I saw housing conditions well below acceptable standards. Last year, the government of Nunavut and the Nunavut Tungavik Incorporated submitted a joint budget request to build more homes. Mm -hmm. They are still waiting. Mm -hmm. When will this government properly invest in housing that will make a difference in people's lives? <laughs> 
The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary, or sorry, the Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the member for her very important question. As she knows, housing is number one priority in the North, in the Arctic. In Budget 2022, we, we moved $4 billion uh, for distinctions-based housing, including $800 million for Inuit Nunagat. In Budget 23, we have $4 billion for Northern uh, northern rural and, and uh, urban housing. Mr. Speaker, we know we are making progress, but there's a lot of work to do. We will get it done. Here, here. Here. The Honourable Member for Brampton South. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I spoke with many residents in Brampton this summer, and I heard a lot about the need to build more homes fast in Canada. We know increasing supply in just one of the major solutions to the housing crisis. Can the Minister of Housing, Infrastructure and Communities tell us how <laughs> removing GST on rental construction can help drive down the cost of housing? Minister of Housing. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank my honourable colleague, the Member of Parliament for Brampton South, for her advocacy for her community, and I enjoyed thoroughly my visit to the City of Brampton, where we worked directly with the Mayor and members of Council and the City to uncover what some of the plans they might advance to help grow the supply of housing in their community. But one of the things we've been hearing over the course of this summer is that we need to change the financial equation for builders to build. They are dealing with higher costs as a result of increased cost of supplies and materials, and they're operating in a higher interest rate environment. That's why I was thrilled when we were able to announce last week we will be getting rid of the GST on apartment construction in Canada to build more homes for Canadians. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, what's more, we have seen provincial governments follow suit. I'm, I, I'm sorry, the time is up. The Honourable Member for Thornhill. Mr. Speaker, after eight years, the Prime Minister and his coalition with the NDP are not worth the cost. Housing is worse than ever and worse than anywhere. Years of inflationary deficit, Canadians are getting crushed with housing costs. Mortgage payments are up 151 percent. That's more than 3500 bucks a month. And in Toronto, it used to take 25 years to pay off a mortgage, and now it takes 25 years to save for a down payment. So will the Prime Minister end his wasteful spending and eliminate his inflationary deficit it, that so Canadians can keep a roof over their head. The Honourable Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, Mike Moffat called our housing plan announced by the Prime Minister last week hugely important. This will make the numbers work. The governments of Ontario, BC and Newfoundland have already followed suit. But what did the Conservatives say about this practical plan to get more homes built? They said, we don't need more spending. Well, how do they think we're going to get homes built in Canada? Is it by magic? We need home builders to invest more and build faster. That is what our government is making possible. That is what is going to fix the housing challenge. The Honourable Member for Thornhill. Speaker, let's play back the tape. In 2015, this Liberal Prime Minister pledged that Canada needs, quote, real change and affordable housing. Eight years after he created this housing hell, he says he's not responsible for housing. Housing prices have doubled. Rents have doubled. Higher taxes and more government spending equals higher inflation and higher interest rates. Canadians can see it. So why is it that the NDP Liberal government are the only ones who can't? The Honourable Minister of Housing. I find it fascinating to watch the Conservatives' line of questioning because they certainly seem to think that they have the solutions to Canada's housing crisis, but when you actually look at what they're proposing, they're just tinkering around the uh, edges with half measures that won't make a meaningful difference. Mr. Speaker, we are getting rid of the GST on apartment construction in this country and provincial governments are following suit. We are advancing measures to change the way that cities build houses so they build them next to transit stations, to colleges and universities, and we are going to require that they build them more densely. We have much more to come over the course of the fall, Mr. Speaker, but if you put our plan against theirs, it'll win seven days a week. The Honourable Member for Charlevoix, Haute Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, after eight years under this Prime Minister's, Canadians are doubly in difficulty. Housing prices have doubled, and the Bank of Canada has warned that mortgage payments uh, could go up by over 40 percent. Remember, in the budget 2023, the Minister of Finance declared that one of the main goals of the budget was to not throw oil on the fires of inflation. When will the Prime Minister stop these inflationist policies so that Canadians can keep a roof over their heads? The Honourable Vice, Prime Min uh, Vice uh, Deputy Prime Minister. 
Canada has the lowest deficit of all the G7 countries, and DBRS Morningstar last week reaffirmed our uh, AAA credit rating. At the same time, we know that we have to work for Canadians. That is why the Prime Minister announced last week that GST on new rental housing would be eliminated. That is why this morning, with my colleague, the Minister for Industry, we had a meeting with the CEOs of all the grocery stores because we are there, we are working for Canadians, and we will continue to do that. The Honourable Member for Charlotte, Gold Saint Charles. Mr. Speaker, does the Minister of Finance know that uh, mortgage payments for an average house are now $3,560 a month? That's an increase of 151 percent since the Prime Minister came to power. In Montreal, people need to have a minimum salary of at least $113,500 to hope to buy a house. These increases are a direct result of the inflationist policies of this Liberal government. Will the government s uh, stop with its inflationist deficits so that uh, Canadians can dream of one day affording a house? The Honourable Minister of Housing. Uh, Monsieur Président. Mr. Speaker, if you want to... Uh, see more housing in Canada, we need to see more investment in seeing housing being built. The problem, they like to assign blame, but when it comes time to advance solutions, they're nowhere to be seen. They are nowhere to be seen. They are advancing half measures that will not make a meaningful lick of difference on the need to build housing at a rate we have never built before. We have re removed taxes on home construction. We are changing the way that cities build homes, and we have made years' worth of investments in affordable housing. We're going to continue to advance policies that make a difference. It's what Canadians deserve. The Honourable Member for Rivière des Mélilles. Mr. Speaker, another example of just how far Ottawa will go to push Quebec aside. The federal government held a competition to design a monument to commemorate the role of our soldiers in Afghanistan. A jury of experts decided that it was the Dao team from Quebec that won, but the Liberals rejected the opinion of these experts. They have publicly admitted that Quebec won, but they're giving the contract to a firm from Ontario instead. Who in this government ordered that the Quebec team be pushed aside at any cost, even if it means breaking their own rules? The Honourable Minister of Veterans. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the monument to commemorate Canada's mission in Afghanistan recognizes the commitment and the sacrifice of our soldiers. Over 40,000 people participated in this mission. Veterans Affairs received comments from over 10,000 Canadians, particularly from veterans, people who participated in the mission, and they all agreed, or the majority agreed, that uh, the concept should really meet their needs. And in the end, the concept from Stimsa Group uh, better reflects exactly what veterans wanted. Mr. Speaker, we will always be there to listen to our veterans. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Rivière des Mélilles. Mr. Speaker, it's very difficult to believe. The worst is that they're admitting it. This is what they wrote to Daou. Despite the fact that the jury designated your concept as uh, the winner of the competition, the government has decided instead to give the contract to another team. So, so much for the jury, so much for the architects, and so much for the artists who worked on this for months and months, and even worse, so much for their own rules. Will the government uh, correct this injustice and give the contract to the company that truly deserved it and that won the competition? The Honourable Minister of Veterans Affairs. Mr. Speaker, as Minister of Veterans Affairs, I think it's very important to make sure that we listen to our veterans, veterans who served during the mission in Afghanistan. And during this process, we heard comments from 10,000 Canadians and a majority of those were people who served uh, in the Afghanistan mission, and they told us very clearly that the submission from the Stimsa group truly represented what they wanted from this monument. We thank the committee, which did extraordinary work, but we want to make sure that we respect the wishes of veterans. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Member for Kildonan, St. Paul. Canada has
some of the most unaffordable housing in the world, Mr. Speaker, and that's after eight years of this Liberal Prime Minister. Mortgages are up over 151 percent, with payments over $3,500 a month. Eight years of inflationary Liberal deficits, driving up interest rates, and homes have become completely unaffordable in Canada. When will the Liberals end their reckless inflationary deficits so that Canadians can once again afford a place to live? The Honourable uh, Minister. Mr. Speaker, why should Canadians trust the Leader of the Opposition on housing? Because when he had the file, he failed hard. In fact, a $300 million fund to build housing in First Nations, set up by the Leader himself, built, wait for it, 99 houses. Shameful. That's right. Oh for every one house, he and the Carper Conservatives built on reserve. Mr. Speaker, we've renovated or built nine. We can't afford his broken ideas. The Honourable Member for Kildonan St. Paul. can deflect and make all the excuses they want, but the fact remains that after eight years of massive Liberal deficits, driving up interest rates and driving up inflation, Canadians can no longer afford a place to live. In 2015, the average rent for a two-bedroom apartment was just over $1,100 a month. Eight years after these Liberals, $2,300 a month. That's the reality Canadians are facing under that Liberal minister. When will the Liberals end this costly NDP coalition and allow Canadians a place to live? Live, Mr. Right, Speaker. Right, right, right. Uh, Deputy Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, Canada has the lowest debt and deficit in the G7, and our AAA rating was reaffirmed by a ratings agency last week. But what we need to ask is what would Conservative austerity do to Canada? Do the Conservatives propose to cut our $200 billion investment in health care? Maybe they propose to cut our investment in early learning and child care, which has already cut fees for parents by 50 percent. Or maybe it's dental care that they would go after. What we know for sure is Conservative austerity hurts Canadians. That's right. That's right. The Honourable Member for Chicoutimi, Le Fjord. Mr. Speaker, after eight years of this Liberal government, mortgage payments have gone up by 151 percent, and the average payment is now $3,560 a month. The Prime Minister said in 2020, and listen closely, we took on debt so that Canadians wouldn't have to. And yet, more than ever, Canadians and Quebecers are having a hard time making ends meet. When will the Prime Minister end his wasteful, useless spending and eliminate these inflationist deficits so that Canadians can keep a roof over their heads. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, first of all, I'd like to thank the Prime Minister for his uh, confidence. It's the first time that I've risen in this House as Minister, so thank you. And, Mr. Speaker, what Quebecers need is a Prime Minister who thinks about them and who works uh, closely with municipalities, not a leader from the opposition who treats municipal leaders uh, uh, as if they're incompetent, uh, with condescension and arrogance. As a former uh, Montreal councillor, I'm outraged to see how the leader of the opposition does not take into account the opinions of uh, municipal leaders. The Honourable Member for Chateau la Colle. Mr. Speaker, in recent months, Canadians have lived through a series of extreme events, including forest fires, drought, heat waves, flooding, and violent storms, which have caused incredible destruction and which have affected the lives of many people across the country. This week, Canada will be in New York for uh, the UN Climate Week. Can the Minister of Environment and Climate Change please tell us what Canada will be putting forward at uh, the General Assembly of the United Nations? The Honourable Minister of the Environment, thank you. I'd like to thank my colleague for her question and for her hard work on this file. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to pass time with her and her constituents who are concerned about climate change and about uh, protecting uh, our natural habitats and about fighting uh, pollution, including plastic pollution. And that's why the Prime uh, Minister, uh, along with uh, some of our colleagues, will be going to New York to work with our colleagues uh, to find solutions to these three major issues. In 2023, only uh, in working on uh, these three issues uh, can a government uh, be considered serious. We will continue to work on these. For Oxford. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, throughout the
the summer, I heard heartbreaking stories from families across Oxford who are struggling to put food on their tables. After eight years of this Prime Minister, this Liberal NDP government is not worth the cost. Their carbon tax has raised the cost of food. For example, the price of onions is up 69%. Will this Prime Minister's big meeting with grocery CEOs reverse the 69% hike by Thanksgiving? Yes or no? The Honourable Minister for Housing. Mr. Speaker, let me begin by congratulating uh, the Honourable Member on taking his spot in this House. But having only recently arrived, Mr. Speaker, uh, he can be forgiven if he's not aware that the party he now forms a member of voted against many of the measures that, in fact, make a direct impact on having life more affordable for his constituents. This includes investments in the Canada Child Benefit. This includes new investments that reduce the cost of child care. This includes new benefits to provide dental care for low-income families. And this includes a rebate that leaves 8 out of 10 families in the province of Ontario better off as a result of putting price on pollution. We can flight climate change and make life more affordable. It's what we've been doing for eight years, and we're going to... The Honourable Member for Calgary Heritage. Yeah. For my neighbours across Calgary, senior savings are going up in smoke. Single moms may not be in the homes of the doors that I knocked, and the dreams of young couples and newcomers devastated. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister and his NDP government have not been worth the cost. Right. After eight years of raising carbon taxes on the farmers and truckers who bring us our food, potatoes are up 68 per cent. Now he wants to quadruple the carbon tax to 61 cents a litre. How much more will that add to the price of potatoes? The Honourable Minister of Health. It's irresponsible to a weary planet that is going through some of its darkest days is although Canada has some of the lowest food inflation and some of the slowest inflation in the world, it is so much more that we have to do. But saying to people who are facing the global challenge of inflation that cutting dental care, that taking away dental care from vulnerable families is a solution to global inflation and the crises that we face, show this. I'm going to, uh, I'm going, I'm going, I, I mean... The Honourable Member for Calgary Heritage, it's his first day here. I'm sure he wants to hear the answer to his question. And we really can't hear it with all the shouting that's going on. So I'm going to ask the Honourable Minister of Health to start from the top so that the Honourable Member can hear the answer. Mr. Speaker, in all times of great challenge globally, there is a responsibility for all of us to focus on solutions and answers. And yes, it's incredibly easy on the other side and point out what's wrong in the world and what's happening, but there are solutions, cutting support and services from the most vulnerable. Let me just talk about dental care for a second. Do you know the number two cause of children in a hospital? Oral health, all of which is preventable. We could stop people from getting ill. We could take action to make our world better better or we can throw around slogans like what is being done on the other side. Let's focus on real answers, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Portage Lisker. Short of the Happy Meal. Mr. Speaker, when I was talking with friends and neighbours this summer, I heard loud and clear that people can't afford the Liberal NDP government's carbon tax. The average farm family will spend an extra $150,000 each year. The people who make the food can't afford that, and the people who buy the food can't afford that. This Prime Minister is simply not worth the cost. After eight years, the Prime Minister has driven up the cost of everything, and Canadians have had enough. When will the Prime Minister listen to Canadians and finally axe the tax? The Honourable Minister of Agriculture. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate my Honourable colleague's question. But the fact is, when you look at what happened in, in our area of the country, Fiona alone, it destroyed burns, it killed cattle, it destroyed wharves. The fact is that it was, if we don't deal with the economy, the cost of everything will go up. We have invested in, in climate change, and this government will continue to invest in climate change, so we will have a place to live. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.
The Honourable Member for King's Hands. It has become abundantly clear to Canadians the challenges that climate change and extreme weather is presenting. In King's Hands, we sadly lost four individuals in our communities with flash floods with, which have not been seen in 50 plus years. The importance of real time emergency alerts to cell phones is so important, but cell reception in some of my communities is simply non existent. Will the Minister of Emergency Preparedness commit to working with the Minister of Industry to push the CRTC and telecoms to improve cell service for communities where no service exists in the interest of their safety and well being? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Minister for Emergency Preparedness. I want to thank my colleague for this very important question. I want to take the opportunity to pass on my sincere condolences to the families who lost loved ones during the uh, flash floods in July. Not every second counts uh, in an emergency, Mr. Speaker, and Canadians uh, need to be informed as quickly as possible when there is a threat to their safety. A public alerting uh, system is an absolute priority uh, for our, our government. We will be speaking to the appropriate uh, agencies, and I'll be working with the provinces and territories, and especially municipalities, to make sure that we have the right system for Canadians. Thank you. The Honourable Member for South Okanagan, West Kootenay. Mr. Speaker, this summer over 16 million hectares of forests burned. More than 200,000 Canadians were forced to flee their homes. To call this wildfire season unprecedented is an understatement. And with off-the-charts global temperatures, we can expect climate change to deliver even more extreme wildfires. It's clear that Canada's wildfire response was overwhelmed. Waiting for help from overseas costs valuable time and money, and the Liberals don't seem to be rushing to fix it. Will the Minister support our call for a national wildfire fighting service which can be deployed immediately where needed? The Honourable Minister. Uh, um, colleague that climate change is having a devastating impact across the country, especially in British Columbia. And um, uh, the member opposite and I actually toured a Soyuz together and saw the impacts directly where a wildfire actually was uh, close to a neighbor, just one meter away, and we thank all the, uh, the firefighters for their amazing work. But well, we need to make sure, uh, Mr. Speaker, we have the right resources at the right place at the right time, and that's what we're committed to doing. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Saanich Gulf Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and to the Honourable Member for Emergency Preparedness, we have to do far more. We know that not only as the member for King's Hant says the cell service is inadequate, cell service goes down even where you have it during climate emergencies. We lose power, we lose landlines. We need a national firefighting force, a national water bomber fleet, and a permanent national task force for climate emergency preparedness for better warnings better communications and better response time. Will the minister set up such a task force immediately? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I look forward to working uh, with my colleague on this. Look forward to meeting with her and listening to, to our, our ideas. Every time we've had an emergency and a disaster across this country, year after year, our folks have continually learned and we applied uh, those lessons um, regularly. And this year in particular, where we had floods, wildfires, and even hurricanes um, at our doorsteps, Mr. Speaker, we will learn from those, put the appropriate uh, resources in place. And I'll be focused on, again, Mr. Speaker, making sure that we have the right resources at the right place uh, at the right time. Thank you. I'm afraid that's all the time we have for question period today. À la suite de discussions entre les deux représentants de... Following discussions among representatives of all parties in the House, it is my understanding that there is consent to observe a moment of silence in honour of our former colleague, the Honourable Monique Bijan.